Hey, Jerry Powell listeners. Wait, Alex, Eric, do you even know who's listening out there? No. no I know Alex is. He's got headphones on. Well, don't you think it's time we found out? How, how would we do that? Uh, listeners, do us a favor. Log into jerrypal.org and complete our one-minute survey. We want to know who you are and how we can do better. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we have some people, very special people in our studio some audience. Very special people in our studio audience. <laughs> studio audience? Studio? <laughs> in our studio. Uh, it's not like it's almost our 100th podcast. I shouldn't. I should have this intro. <laughs> we should have the intro down by down now. Down pat. We have Kate Posseen, who is a neuropsychologist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Kate. Very happy to be here. And we have Sarah Delaney, who's a clinical nurse specialist also at the Memory and Aging Center. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. Thanks. Sarah. I'm a big fan. All right. I am super psyched about this podcast because I think it's amazing. Like it really is. I, the more I read about it and I went through like all your online stuff, the more excited I became about this. So we're going to be talking about the care ecosystem um, uh, it's a JAMA paper that just came out uh, in internal medicine. I guess care ecosystem is in the JAMA paper, but they just published in JAMA internal medicine um, about this uh, project. And we'll talk more about that. But before we do, do you have a song request for Alex? Yes, we do. It's Forever Young by Bob Dylan. Oh, when you said Forever Young, I thought it was <laughs> Alphaville. Anybody remember the, the German synth pop band <laughs> Alphaville? Remember? No. Forever who wants to live? Oh, I do remember that. Ah, uh, yes. Let's do oh. that one. <laughs> I didn't prepare that one. That, that, was, that was the one we should have John Newman do when he did it. Oh, uh, right, right. Living Forever did, through. Right. Who Wants to Live Forever by Queen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know this one. Ah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Dylan, classic. Do I get to say why I picked this one? Yeah, why'd you pick it? Why'd you pick it? Um, Because my mom sang it to me when I was a kid. And really? also because the director of the Mac... Uh, Bruce Miller is a big fan of um, Bob Dylan, so ah. two reasons. Does he like Alphaville, though? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Alphaville, if you're listening, uh, we are sorry. <laughs> May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. May you stay. To live forever, forever, <laughs> we got disco fever. Forever, forever. Um, before we jump into the jam intro medicine uh, paper and care ecosystem, I just like maybe take a step back. How did you get interested in this, and in particular dementia and helping caregivers? Um, either you can start. Wow. I think we've both been at it for such a long time. Um, I can say why I got so excited about the idea of the care ecosystem. I was a neuropsychologist studying brain behavior relationships and taking care of patients at the Memory and Aging Center and noticing we were providing quite good care at our, our tertiary uh, center, but that most people with dementia in their families were not receiving this type of care. Most never even see a dementia specialist. And so I felt compelled, along with my colleagues, to design a model of care that could reach patients and families wherever they live. And so this idea really took us on, on this journey um, to the care ecosystem and the continued journey to try to transform dementia care. Mm -hmm. And how about for you, Sarah? Well, if I really step back... Um, I was a modern dancer and I got into this because I had to have a side job to support myself. And I worked with people with um, developmental disabilities. And one of the people I worked with, um, you know, her mom, sh she was in her 60s and her mom was 80, single mom, raised this woman with a developmental disability. You know, her husband left and, and everything. So I ended up being an AmeriCorps volunteer and working with people with developmental disabilities and went from that to dementia. Um, 
So I was a live-in caregiver for two years as an AmeriCorps volunteer and um, just kind of, I love people with um, different behavior, you know, it's super interesting and working with caregivers, I think they're just like the heroes of today. So so, so you started out as a modern dancer and then uh, became a geriatric clinical nurse specialist as a side job. <laughs> <laughs> and now that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a, a lot of fascinating a lot of prerequisites that people take <laughs> from, it's great. from dance to this. <laughs> and I think that's the fascinating thing, like uh, especially in dementia care, but really in care for most older adults um, with multimorbidity, frailty, that like, we rely on caregivers so much from a medical system, but we we do almost nothing for them. Like you, it's impossible to find the name of a caregiver in most. EHRs like it's just not there Thank like you. what the but but you know it's we we can do like tavers and these really expensive procedures but god forbid we do anything for the person who's actually keeping this individual at home um and let let alone naming them in an EHR and if they didn't exist like good luck with your patient especially if they have cognitive impairment i mean i, I don't i don't there isn't aside from putting someone in a nursing home, which is really expensive and inappropriate for people through most of the course of their life with dementia, you know, th- there isn't a, a program or system that can do everything that a caregiver does. Yeah. And a mo- very rare programs out there to help caregivers, aside from the one that you guys just <laughs> made. Um, care ecosystem. Can you give us a little bit of background? Like what is care ecosystem? Absolutely. So, all right. So the care ecosystem does indeed think about the patient and the caregiver together in providing the care. And and that is really at its, at its core. And we pair the, um, that team with our care team navigator. So the care team navigator is an unlicensed dementia specialist. We train them. So it could be somebody who's fresh out of college, maybe wants to go on to be a nurse or a doctor in the future. And they go through our training program. Um, so, so they don't need any formal medical training prior to your training. That's right. And the training program usually takes about a month with us. And then they're ready to go. The key ingredients in a navigator is not what you know medical degree they have. It's that they, can, uh, they have a lot of empathy, that they communicate well on the phone, that they're excited to help our um, people with dementia and their families navigate this complex disease. Those are the key ingredients. So we pair a care team navigator with the family and they develop a relationship together. They're over the phone. It's all over the phone, um, internet as well. And the care team navigator... Video conferencing internet? or If they want. It's up to the caregiver. If they want video conferencing, we'll do it with video conferencing. I've been surprised that not as many people have wanted video conferencing, but the people who do... Are, are pretty reliable. But you know, yeah. sometimes people, we have to talk to them when they're on their lunch break at work or yeah. driving home from work on the yeah. phone. And so video is not really possible. <laughs> so no in-person visits. This is all done. There are some in-person visits. So some of the people enrolled in our study are also seen at the Memory Aging Center clinic. Yeah. And, you know, caregivers love the opportunity to meet people. So if the person is still coming into clinic, they'll ask, um, you know, if the navigator can come to the appointment with them. Um, and they love that. Um, but it's not always possible. And, yeah. you know, we, we serve people across the state of California, across, I mean, our partners at UNMC in um, Omaha, Nebraska, serve Iowa and Nebraska. And um, so phone is for the, for the majority. Wow. And the first thing that people think when they hear it's a phone-based program is, wow, great, that probably saves a lot of money. And And maybe that is true. We think it is true. But we think it's actually better care for these families. They can get the help when they need it. They don't have to make a doctor's appointment. They don't have to take their loved one with dementia into the car and drive um, to that doctor's appointment. No, they get help when they have an urgent situation, when the patient's acting agitated and they don't know how to handle it. Mm. And furthermore, we can reach patients and families wherever they live. There are many parts of this country where there are no dementia specialists. And so that lifeline to us is the only access that they have. I, I loved your map on the Jam Internal Medicine article. You can actually see where these individuals are. And it's not just in like dense urban areas like San Francisco. Like it's in Central Valley in California. It's in Northern, like most people think of Northern California, as San Francisco. But like we have hundreds of miles Up north of us that's really yeah. rural. And there's little dots all over there. Yeah. 
It's interesting. So, so is it? So, do you give them instruct these uh, uh, persons with dementia, their caregivers, instruction that if you have an emergency, call us first? No, we have a guide um, because we're not providing the medical care for mm-hmm. these people, right. and so we come up with a plan for them. For you know, if we actually developed a little guide, so if they're having something like a rash or an upset stomach mm-hmm. or um, even a sudden um, change of behavior, you know, they can call us for that. But if, if so, we teach them about delirium really early on, you know, that early your really sudden changes in function or behavior is something that often needs um, a medical evaluation. Mm-hmm. We also give them the twenty four seven helpline from the Alzheimer's Association because that's an important resource. It really can help people deescalate a situation. You know, if it, any twenty four seven. So we rely on that for. Um, people after hours because we're not a 24-7 on-call service. And, um, you know, we we give them guidance around, you know, when you actually do need to take someone to the emergency room if they're having difficulty mm-hmm. breathing or if that's part of their goals of care. This is fascinating. So I've got... Light, we have had a couple of uh, podcasts now about the navigators, sort of lay health navigators, community navigators, etc. cetera. Um, and one of the key pieces is always what kind of training do they receive? So I uh, hear that they're trained about delirium and maybe rashes. Can you tell us what else you cover in that one month? Well, they're training? not necessarily trained about rashes. Right. They just know like they can't handle rashes. Okay. It's mostly about like learning their scope and like, right. you know, what's within the bounds and when they need to refer to somebody else. Right. Yeah. Right. So they, they have a lot of standardized materials. So like what I mentioned, this guidance, it's written down on a, I think it's called a safety plan and it has like, you know, their doctor's information and who to call when, and it says when to call their CTN. And it's mostly around when they need someone to talk to or when, you know, they're not sure if this is normal or not, you know, with dementia. CTN being care team navigator. Right. And so to tell us what kind of, uh, so what else was in the training in this one month for these, these navigators? Well, we have aging 101 and uh-huh. ethics that's, um, taught by Anna Chodos, a geriatrician from UCSF. We have, um, medication that's, uh, medication issues in aging and, um, with dementia, which is taught by pharmacists. We had Kirby Lee and then now we're working with, mm-hmm. uh, Shalini Lynch and, um, I do, uh, you know, dementia basics. And we talk a lot about behaviors. Jennifer Marilies, um, n- another clinical nurse specialist uh, investigator on our team, talks about behaviors and also caregivers, supporting caregivers, caregiver challenges. Um, we have a social worker on the team that talks about benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, other community benefits. And um, an attorney, Sarah Hooper from the UC Hastings and Winston Chong, a neuroethicist, neurologist, um, they've really put a lot of thought into advanced care planning, both medical leave legal and um, financial and how they, so they get training on capacity Mm. um, in dementia, not how to determine capacity, but just being aware that this is really, it's really important to get advanced care planning conversations in while someone has capacity and, um, you know, also learning about end of life and the kinds of decisions people have to make and, um, you know, supporting them and, and making these decisions, trying to honor the person's values. And that's, a, that's a pretty amazing all-star cast there. And when I first read this article, you know, part of me felt like, okay, I've seen this before. This is stuff that, that's going to be, it's going to be published. Nobody's going to really have access to it except for this like local institution that like, does this. But then I started reading through your stuff and clicking through all the links. Like, you can actually go to your box folder and, like, download all this stuff. Go to your website and actually do the training. Like, I was so impressed how how available this information is. Like, I, I was just downloading stuff left and right today <laughs> just to see what's there. <laughs> And the whole training program, too, is is all available now for free through Coursera. So if a health system wants to adopt Canvas. this program... Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Canvas. I say that, I do this amazing. So. <laughs> yes. And, right. So a health system, health system leader can go and access all of those video trainings for new care team navigators and get them up to speed. That is so... I, I mean, the thing that made me... Like, I'm really cynical now after, like, the MoCA started charging for, like, um, <laughs> you, so... And I'm just so impressed by kind of making this very open access so anybody can actually use these tools. It's it's really refreshing. So 
Thank you. I think the other thing about that is, you know, we've done things a certain way here um, that works for our team at UCSF and our implementation sites are all kind of adapting for their setting. And I, I think we're learning a lot from ways that they're adapting it. So I think people don't have to try to do it exactly the way that we've done it. I mean, you know, we've had to do it a certain way because of being a randomized controlled trial and um, also not being linked necessarily. People aren't all UCSF patients who so are serving people outside of our health system, whereas our implementation sites are um, serving people within a health system. So there's some adaptation for that. Mm. And we'll have links to all of your uh, your website and some of this material mm-hmm. on our Jerry Pal post that's going to be accompanying this uh, podcast. I was also wondering, are there like imp- key protocols that these CTNs care team, care team navigators, navigators um, th- th- that they made sh- that you guys made sure that they did? Throughout the course of their time with their caregiver? Well, not everybody is going to get through all of them. We, we do train them to... That's the goal, is to go through all of the um, protocols, which include advanced care planning and medication review and reconciliation, checking on medication changes, um, behavior management, safety, uh, screen, and working on uh, caregiver attending to caregiver well-being specifically. Um referrals to community and education resources. That's sort of an ongoing thing. So so some of the protocols, I think they're probably following some of it on every call. And others, it, de- it just depends on whether the caregiver can get there. Um, you know, some caregivers don't necessarily want to be caregivers and um, they are really resistant to anything <laughs> around continuing that role, even though they might feel kind of stuck in it. So it depends on how uh, it's really individualized. So we have the protocols as a guide. And who else is involved? So you have this care team navigator, Mm -hmm. but there were other people uh, that were involved in the care ecosystem, I think the team-based aspect is really important because I think like you said, you're getting sarcastic about the MOCA. You know, I think in dementia, there's this tendency to become fatalistic of like, Mm -hmm. oh, I I can't think of anything else that's going to work. And that's what's important about having a team. And, you know, the the evidence around medication or any of these strategies is not so strong that you can just say black or white, this is what you should do. So it's, you know, helpful to have a team to discuss like, well, this is what's going on and what do you Mm -hmm. think? And, you know, the caregiver is going to have their own opinion. So it's really a collaborative process. And I think that team aspect, we meet every week and we discuss challenging cases. And And who's on that team? So all the care team navigators and then in our in-person weekly meeting, we have uh, the two clinical nurse specialists and then our social worker. And we have a monthly call with our pharmacist because we found when the pharmacist was in on the in-person meetings, the medication aspect really dominated the discussion. And so we we save the medication call and then we're available. They're available to consult um, electronically, you know, outside of that monthly call. Mm. But um, yeah, so our weekly team meeting is the social workers, nurses, and um, care team navigators. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So um, this is, uh, we we have some understanding of what the uh, care ecosystem intervention involved. Um, Now you studied it for this uh, manuscript here, and it looks like you had three sites, as you mentioned. You had two main sort of hubs, right. but you recruited patients from California, from Nebraska and from Iowa. And you had a single blind randomized trial. You had, um, uh, you had sort of two to one, uh, patients with dementia and caregiver dyads and about 500 and then 200, about 250 dyads who received usual care. So about 500 in the intervention, about 250 in the control group. Was um, that hard to recruit caregivers? Well, we found the easiest. We tried lots of methods to recruit because we had a very we had very ambitious recruitment targets, as you can see. So we tried a number of different methods, and the method that yielded by far the most dyads is by working directly with trusted providers. So going to primary care physicians and and using their EMR to run lists of patients with dementia, and then um, you know writing a letter to those families signed by the physician, inviting them to participate, and then we'd follow up via phone. This got most of our patients. But what we found is we were getting a bias in our sample towards people who had, you know, more education, more resources using this method. So we then did a lot more community outreach to try to bring in people from more underserved communities, 
giving um, talks or connecting with community organizations. It was a lot more work for each enrollment, but it helped us bring in more underserved um, people, including uh, monolingual Spanish-speaking and Cantonese-speaking cohorts. And is this designed for all stages of dementia, like mild, moderate, severe, like when we're thinking about who this is appropriate for? Yeah, and we follow people. I mean, it's been a real pleasure and joy to follow these people, you know, from the study, some of them we've followed for, you know, for almost five years. So it's really, you get to follow them when they're maybe not even seeing their provider anymore. They're on hospice, they graduate from hospice, they're on hospice again. Mm. Um, <laughs> Heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> So really throughout the, the yeah, life course. throughout of- the course, yeah. And we think that's so important. We really designed this model of care to work ideally from diagnosis all the way till the end stages of the disease. Mm. And the care needs to be tailored throughout that. There's different needs that emerge throughout the different stages of dementia. And there's mm. also times when things might be going pretty smoothly and the family doesn't need a lot of help from us. But then some sort of new crisis emerges and it really helps them that they have that relationship in place. And what was the, the, the main thing that you're hoping to see when you're, when you're doing this study? Like, what were you hoping to, to see in the results? I mean, I, I was thinking more about just helping people. <laughs> 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 right. Well, we, yeah, we thought a lot about the outcomes. This was the first randomized controlled trial that I've ever run. And we, first and foremost, wanted to improve the quality of the life for the family with dementia. This intervention is not designed to slow down dementia. It's designed to improve the experience for the people living with the disease. Did it? And yes. (laughs) We were so thrilled that, yes. So when you run a clinical trial, you have to pre-specify your primary outcome. And that has to be significant for it to be considered a positive trial. And so we were very fortunate Uh, that our primary outcome quality of life for the person with dementia was um, significantly improved in the treatment group relative to the control. Mm -hmm. And that's as rated by the caregiver on a rather large scale. Correct. And it covers a number of domains. Yes. Is, Is there any way of sort of, it's hard to quantify quality of life, like quality of life was... Uh, improved marginally for a lot of folks or was it improved in a big way for a few folks or is there some way of sort of because I see a beta coefficient here but I don't exactly know how to interpret that everybody wants the answer to this question that's a lot harder to answer (laughs) than you might think at first blush but you know on average the treatment improved quality of life by half a point for each patient. What does that mean? Well, if you move one point, that means that a key component of quality of life moved from poor to fair or from good to excellent. So that seems clinically meaningful to me. Great. And you had other outcomes that you looked at. What what, what were those outcomes and what did you find? We also looked at uh, utilization by the patient. So in other words, we looked at ambulance use, emergency department use, and hospital use. Um, And what we found there, and and this was all, again, caregiver report. We will be looking at claims data from Medicare claims data as that becomes available. So this is all caregiver report. And we ask every six months about the utilization. And what we found was that the program reduced the emergency room visits of the patient. So, you know, this was really exciting. I think it suggests um, what we tried to do may have worked, you know, reduce this crisis-oriented approach to care that we see so often in dementia. Do you remember by how much did it reduce it? So for every five patients who were enrolled in the treatment, uh, we reduced an emergency room visit for one. So the number needed to treat was five. Wow. Which is amazing (laughs) when you think... Think about the number needed to treat for common interventions <laughs> that we, uh, you know, yeah. use every day in primary care, like statins for uh, secondary prevention. I, I just looked this up, and the number was like three hundred. Yeah, you know, so high. This one in five yeah. to prevent an emergency department admission. I think like, uh, uh, Aricept doesn't do that. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, everybody's on it. <laughs> Um, uh, so I, there was a line in your results section about cost outcomes. And so, uh, um, it wasn't a major feature of the paper, but it stuck out as potentially cost savings. Is that right? When you added up the costs of the services that you provided 
and the uh, the the acute care visits that were avoided. It ended up being something, was it around $600 per dyad? Yes, that's right. And we saw all of the cost savings in the latter six months. So this was a 12-month trial. And it takes a while to get the care plan in place and work with the caregiver, address their needs first before interventions are implemented for the patient. So all of these cost savings, about $600 per uh, person with dementia, were realized in the latter six months. We're now continuing this trial. So we're continuing it continuing it for five years. Hmm. And so we're hopeful that we'll see those cost savings be maintained or grow even further. Hmm. That is fascinating. So improved so, quality of life, less utilization as far as ED, and it's cost savings. Yeah. And how about the caregivers? Did you look at the, study the caregivers at all? Any outcomes with them? Wasn't that the quality of life? No, the quality of the life patient. for, some, oh, that for was a person for the with dementia as rated by the caregiver. Oh, as rated. I get it now. Yeah. Quality of life for right. the caregiver? So we measured the well-being of the caregiver in three ways, and all of them showed significant effects. So we improved um, self-efficacy of the caregiver by six months. So their feelings that they, they can take care of their loved one, that they're prepared for the future challenges. We... Uh, we decreased depression in the caregiver. And this is really important. We also had a, another publication recently in JAMA Neurology that showed that caregiver depression is a big predictor of emergency room visits in the patient. Mm. So this may be one of the mechanisms by which we are reducing emergency room visits. And we also reduced feelings of caregiver burden. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really important when you mentioned that there's no caregiver's name in the electronic medical record, because it's not even just that their name or phone number might not be there, but we're not considering, you know, how does this caregiver feel about managing this person's care. I mean, their caregiver's mental health and another study has been shown to affect the patient's mortality. Yeah. Um, so I think we're really missing a big piece of what affects the patient's overall health. So this is tremendously exciting results. I, and people are going to want to unpack this and see, well, you did this multi-component intervention. What what worked? What's the one what, piece you know, we can take? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, or, it, but, but from your angle, you know, as it being embedded in this and doing this work for so long, like, are there any stories that you could carefully anonymize, for example, <laughs> for public consumption about, you know, um, so-and-so, you know, we can't reach out to this caregiver. They're having this issue and we address that. And we think that that's the sort of uh, impact that our study had. Well, you know, the the thing that I think is the biggest secret of the caregiver system is people think, oh, it's over the phone. Like, what do you actually know? You know, like you're not in the house. You're not really seeing what their life is like. You're missing like half the picture. And um, I think the fact that, you know, f for some of the really people who, who need a lot more help, you know, we also work with some caregivers who may have some cognitive impairment themselves. They're also in their 80s mm -hmm. and they might forget the name of the care team navigator. And if they don't call them every week, they might forget, you know, to answer the phone or something. So who else is, is seeing that person? Mm -hmm. You know, like they're going to, they're forgetting their doctor's appointments or, yeah. you know, the doctors, we've had a lot of people who the primary care provider has changed. Primary care providers in some areas don't accept Medicare patients. And so the continuity of care that the care team navigator provides and, you know, APS, they, you refer to APS, they close the case in a month. They may not open the case. They may not see the situation as, you know, dire enough depending on their resources. And, um, so, you know, we're able to keep, <laughs> keep at plugging away and making sure that someone is getting the help that they need. And again, with the team of being able to think of like, what else can we do? What else, what other resource might be there? Yeah. I mean, I think the people for me that really make it, we had someone who had a lot of ED visits, the caregiver was just super overwhelmed and his wife is so attached to him that she really, you know, they had her in a nursing home temporarily and they just, they couldn't keep, she was constantly asking about her husband, where is he? And, um, so we were able to help them, you know, figuring out how to qualify for Medicaid, for example, if your income is sort of borderline, like that takes a lot of, um, skill and advocacy and just, you know, having paperwork, um, so helping people access like in-home supportive services. So at least, you know, she could be in the home with a little bit more help and support for the caregiver. You know, so they're addressing their needs and advocating with the primary care provider that, you know, sometimes we need medications just so that this person, the caregiver doesn't lose it. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I, I love that aspect too, because it, it really did feel comprehensive. It wasn't just about like medications and polypharmacy and advanced directives, but also thinking about those things that caregivers, like when you're a caregiver of somebody with dementia or when you're a loved one, it's like, oh my gosh, I never thought about like, what happens to the finances? Who's going to manage that? How do I even manage like his finances? I don't have access to his bank account. The banks don't like thinking holistically what matters to people with dementia. And when I was looking through the protocols, a lot of those things were in there. Wasn't- there are so many little things you wouldn't even imagine. Like yeah. we had one lady who she was getting older and shrinking and she had this hairdresser that she got her hair done. Then like the, the, she no longer fit in the seat to get her hair cut. And oh. that was like her, she wasn't, she refused bathing. So it's like actually really important that she goes to the hairdresser to get her mm-hmm. hair. That's when she gets her hair washed. And so like calling around to try to find places yeah. Where you know she can, they can have a booster seat or something on the. That's great. These practical, creative <laughs> solutions, right? And you don't need a like a physician to to help, right? Right. right. And, and it's yet, actually a lot of work calling around to right. make all these calls. So you don't really need a nurse or a social worker doing that either. Right. Yeah. Like going back to kind of the the study and the care ecosystem. How do you define who is a caregiver? I can imagine for a lot of these patients, they have formal and informal caregivers. They have a family member in Connecticut um, who's providing a lot of caregiving, but from a distance and, you know, a formal caregiver here. How did you guys think about the word caregiver? For the trial, we wanted to identify one caregiver who was going to stay with us for the whole trial. It was really important for the measurement to have the same caregiver answering the questions at each survey time point. But in reality, Patients often have a team of caregivers, or at least we hope they do. In fact, if they don't, we often try to help them get a a team of caregivers. Yeah. Um, So, but yeah, we just looked for someone who identified as a primary caregiver and they didn't have to live with the patient. Some of them lived in other states. For them, uh, nearly all were a family member. Most were spouses, followed by daughters. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this a little bit before and we were kind of joking, but sad but true (laughs) that with results like this if this were a drug you know some pharmaceutical company would have picked it up and making you know billions of dollars off of it but it's not a drug so i guess the next question is you have impressive results there have been other studies of you know dementia care you mentioned some in your discussion you know based out of ucla based out of other places uh, that have also had encouraging findings. Uh, yours is distinct from those, but there, you know, in some, there are a number of potential interventions that could be done that are non-pharmacological and uh, have promising uh, results for people with dementia and their caregivers. What can we do to change the system or what, what hope is there for these interventions being implemented uh, in this country? This gap between practice and research is the one of the biggest challenges. And it's one that we have thought about from designing this intervention. Everything that we did here with the care ecosystem was with an eye towards scale in terms of how the intervention was designed, that it could work from hubs, extending the reach of specialists, for example, making it phone-based. We were always thinking about scale. We were really influenced by um, people like Laura Gitlin who write about this science practice gap. So what can we do now? Um, Well, one thing we're doing is trying to make the process for setting up the care ecosystem as easy as possible for health systems. I mean, it's never easy, but as easy as possible. And so that's why our trainings are online, the toolkit. If you go to our website, it's a one-stop shop for everything care ecosystem. So we want to give them the tools. We also published a paper on the costs of setting it up so health systems can plan for those costs. The startup costs, there's always startup costs in setting up a new program. And unfortunately, Medicare doesn't usually pay those costs. And so we find health systems need to get some philanthropy or a grant to get a program like this off the ground. But then we provide a lot of guidance on, you know, potential billing mechanisms or other ways to sustain the program. I I loved your toolkit. I just... (laughs) <laughs> like reading it, like how do I talk to my stakeholders about like like thinking about this? What kind of questions w- would they have? Like it's it's a great toolkit um, for starting this up, and I think that's what often is missing in most of these interventions. It's oh look at this great thing that we did, and then it stops at the publication, and nothing after that. You don't see it in, in many other places, and this is just it's there. It's built into the study too. Like it was impressive. 
For us, the metric of success is not that we publish this paper. The metric of success will be that health systems are delivering this care to families. And getting on the Jerry Powell podcast. This (laughs) is... Right. 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 That's your ambition. We can go home now. (laughs) We're done. You can go back to dancing, Sarah. That's right. And and, uh, and are are there health systems who are interested or who are starting to participate? Yeah. So I think because of, I think because we put these materials online and even before this paper was published, health systems were reaching out to us and we are always so excited to take those phone calls and talk to them about their, uh, as they were considering setting up this type of program and three different health systems decided to go forward with it around the same time, around June of 2018. It was pretty cool that they all at the same time. Um, so Oxner in Louisiana, Health Partners in Minnesota, and University of Colorado at Denver as well. And so we've been working together as a team. We have monthly calls, all four of, of our groups together, uh, to talk about the challenges that that we're all facing and um, how they're adapting the program for their health system, how they're approaching sustainability so that we can learn from each other. So we're actually studying the process of implementation and offering our help as as much as we can to these health systems to um, you know, maximize the likelihood of success. We hope now that this paper's out, we'll get some more phone calls from other health systems. Right. We can't wait for those phone calls. So please right. call yeah. us. <laughs> So we'll have your the link to your website. Contact information is on the website too. If they're interested in learning more about Care Ecosystem and starting it up in their their healthcare system, yes, please send us an email. Help us build a Care Ecosystem as a national model of dementia care. Yes, it should be. It should be. It should be our Care Ecosystem. Oh, last question for me: Why why Care Ecosystem? What? Why that term? What is ecosystem? Someone on the team before I came along came up with it, but I think it's brilliant. I mean, I was kidding with Eric beforehand. He was mm-hmm. because they plant trees as part of the, <laughs> that's not it. <laughs> yeah, I think it refers to the multidisciplinary team nature uh, that's needed to take care of dementia, that we're involving the family, that we're involving the navigator, the existing providers, um, and our multidisciplinary um dementia specialist team that we all need to work together um, and address whatever the needs are to help the patient. And I love that you, you included community um, providers so like Alzheimer's Association, amazing resource for individuals out there. It's so underutilized. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think this really illustrates the ecosystem nature of dementia care and that if you provide robust support for caregivers, which is to me one of the major components of this intervention and why it was successful, then you will impact not only the caregiver, but also most importantly, also importantly, the person with dementia. And so that in an ecosystem, you know, any given piece, if it's not supported, the whole, it affects the whole system. And I think that's absolutely true here. Great. With that, I I think, I want to send you a big, big thank you for joining us today on this podcast. But maybe before we say goodbye, we can have a little bit more of uh, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. A little bit more Bob Dylan. May your hands always be busy. May your feet always be swift. May you have a strong foundation, may the winds of change shift. May your heart always be joyful, may your song always be sung. May you stay forever young. May you stay forever young. Forever. <laughs> He's so forever. stuck on Queen. <laughs> forever young. Forever young. I'm gonna have that song in my head all day. <laughs> oh no, that's the other one. That's Alphaville. The Alphaville. Alphaville. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For all those a- folks who grew up in the '80s, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and with that, I want to thank big, big thank you to our listeners for joining us today, and both of you for joining us and giving us this thank great you, thank tour you, of uh, Care Ecosystem. Um, Thank you, Jerry Powell. Yay. Thanks, everyone. Bye.